This is me when I was at primary school. I went to a school union the other day. But I started with this quote by Karis One, the rapper for Boogie Down Productions. It's quite a challenging quote. I mean, this is from 1992, and I remember when the song came out. And he's a very conscious rapper, you know, black consciousness. He's the one who's founded the Stop the Violence movement in the 90s. Um, and they call him the intellect, the professor, that kind of thing. Um, but he's got this quote, if you don't know the history of the author, you don't know what you're reading. And I remember, I mean, this is the first time I've ever used it in a lecture. This is the first time I've given this lecture as well, by the way. Um, and I think it's challenging. I haven't put it there as a rule for you to live by, and I don't really live by it, but I do think it's an interesting notion to try to get to understand where someone's coming from, whether they're theorist or practitioner or whatever, to know something about their biography, their motivation. Um, and I think it's an interesting one. The reason I've got it in here is because I think it would be useful to, for you to get to know me a bit, to understand why and how this methodology developed. Um, but even, I remember when I was doing my anthropology MA, I kind of wanted to know, okay, yeah, Marx or Weber or whoever, you know, what, who are they? I didn't want to just know their theories. I also wanted to know a bit about them and what their motivations were and all these kind of things. I think particularly in a discipline like anthropology, when you find out half of them are racist or anti-Semitic or something. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so and that is quite a big deal. So having an understanding of who these people are, like Max Weber, I love his ideas as a theorist, don't love his ideas as a racist. Do you know what I mean? And that's problematic. How do you deal with that? Um, but, you know, as Gillian was kind of pointed out, I do kind of a number of different things. I don't really have a specialism, and it is sometimes a bit of a problem. Um, but they, uh, there's three main kind of threads that I kind of pull on, I think, that inform what I do. My BA was film and photography, and that was as a filmmaker or as a photographer. So kind of, you know, art practice. My MA was social anthropology with pathway media anthropology, like purely theoretical. And I didn't want to do a practice-based MA because I was already doing lots of practice. So I wanted a, an ideas-based, theory-based MA, and anthropology was it. And I was kind of always interested with you know, archive, old images, you know, and that kind of traditional anthropology, even though knowing it's problematic, and I'll get into a bit, of, a bit of that a bit later. And then my PhD, which was here, was looking at community media, and it was kind of an ethnographic anthropology of community media activities, work with young people, you know, interviewing young people, project facilitators that were running these media projects, but it was kind of bringing together anthropological thinking, you know, post-colonialism was in there, and all these other things, as well as, um, you know, kind of media skills. So it kind of started to join the dots. And I think what I do now is often pull on one of these threads or more, depending on what project I'm on. But I think these are the three discourses that definitely inform what I do. And the community media, I think, that kind of participatory um, you know, celebrating voice and multiple perspectives, that's definitely something that, that I try to continue with my academic work. Um, this is just an example of a self-portrait. I'm just kind of, sh I've got images peppered throughout this. I think this is one of the images that kind of maybe bring together some of those threads. I was kind of interested in how St. George is a British English patron saint, I should say, um, and that symbol, but it's a symbol that's very much been co-opted by the far right. I believe everyone should have the right to, you know, be proud and display and celebrate who they are without the far right intervening in that. Um, and I was interested in how St. George is also the patron saint of lots of other countries that have got nothing to do with colonialism. They've just got their own relationship with St. George, you know, Ethiopia which is a big part of my research. Their patron saint is St. George. It's got nothing at all to do with um, an English influence. You know, Greece, Rio de Janeiro, all these other places have got St. George. And I was interested in kind of the symbolism. And this is where, where I guess the visual anthropology element comes in, the symbolism of the flag, symbolism of the dreadlocks, um, which are kind of an English and African symbolism. And it's kind of presented in this kind of poster form. So kind of interesting in, yeah, I think a lot of the things I'm interested in visually in photography have got these kind of tensions inherent in the image, even if they're quite subtle. Um, 
Linda Tray Smith, in her book Decolonizing Methodologies, on the very first page, she says the term research is inextricably linked to European imperialism and colonialism. The word itself, research, is probably one of the dirtiest words in the indigenous world's vocabulary. You know, very challenging opening statement. Um, so, coming from a place of I guess practice, work with communities, work with young people in a community context. Working, I've been working in academia for 20 years, but that was on par with a lot of my other practice working in community context. So I kind of all, often feel I span inside and outside of the university, if you like. So trying to do research with people that you have affection for um, when you're knowing that there's this challenge and this this relationship this tension with what you might be doing you know makes you stop and think how how should things be going you know makes you think about your own methodology your own approach and this is the tension that small anthropology is kind of born out of really. um so this is a photograph that I sort of produced with my friend Wani, and we're kind of looking at this idea of return gaze. You know, she's Jamaican, British, looking at this image of Maasai and this kind of recognition or relic, um, empathy and epif uh, affinity with Africans and diaspora and Africans on the continent. Um, and this idea that you can be looking at images where you don't know how they've been produced the ethics of how they've been produced, but you're kind of looking through that and seeing that kind of cultural connection. There's a cultural connection across divides, um, across time and space, but you know there's still kind of a, a relationship. Um, Johan Dalton has got this, again, quite challenging scene. He says, a painting used to hang in the ante-room of former President Kwame Nkrumah's office. The painting was enormous, and the main feature was Yutrim himself fighting, wrestling with the last chains of colonialism. The chains are yielding, there is a thunder and lightning in the air, and the earth is shaking. Out of all of this, three small figures are fleeing, white men pallid. One of them is the capitalist, he carries a briefcase. The other is a priest or missionary, he carries the Bible. The third lesser figure carries a book entitled African Political Systems. He's the anthropologist. And in my context, it's also important to understand that the anthropologist is also the photographer. You know, photography grew up, you know, 1839, when the daguerreotype was invented, grew up at a time which was in parallel with colonial expansion, in parallel with studies like anthropology, sociology. Um, you know, Howard Becker's got a good essay called Photography and Sociology, how they grew up as kind of twins, if you like. So photography is very much implicit within the kind of the colonial uh, project, um, and you know early early anthropologists, you know Margaret Mead, Franz Boas, um, other people were also photographers. I'm not saying they're all kind of wicked individuals, but they were working within a colonial kind of context, regardless of their own kind of ethics. So there are problematics, and even within with photography today. There's certain aesthetics, like the deadpan photographs, where you've got people just stood in front of the camera in a really serious face, which is very trendy in photography, but that actually harkens back to a, um, quite a scientific approach to photography, that kind of photographing specimens, objects. Mm -hmm. And I'll kind of talk about that in a minute. So, yeah, so again, this kind of working within these kind of discourses and tools. And um, so, yeah, here's an example of kind of deadpan, um, and particularly, you know, working with the Dogura type, which is where you have, to, you have to sit still, but that's where that aesthetic comes from. So the photographer Joseph Zeely uh, was working with the biologist, race scientist Louis Agassiz, and took these photographs of Jack and Delia in South Carolina in 1850. Um, and they were lost for a long time, and then they're rediscovered in Harvard's Peabody Museum. Um, and the image, particularly of Delia, is quite infamous because you can see she's got tears in her eyes, and a, a writer called Molly Rogers 
Uh, she's a kind of photography theorist, creative writer, has got a book called Delia's Tears where she looks at all of the individuals that are photographed in this series and starts to kind of semi-fictionalise their narratives of what life must have been like living in that plantation. And this is one of the only, there's, there's quite a few um, portraits of, you know, you've got the profile, you've got the back of them, so they're very uh, scientific in that sense. Um, but they're one of the only bodies of work still existing of enslaved Africans, um, you know, photographed in this way. Um, and, you know, I start to negotiate and think about creative relationships with these images, you know. The fact that I've, these are my ancestors, um, again, there's that connection, that empathy, but at the same time, I haven't lived through what they've lived through. I haven't seen what they've seen. I haven't walked exactly in their footsteps. So my own self-portrait is echoes of familiarity but difference. I'm naked, but I'm not vulnerable. I'm covering my nakedness, where Jack and Delia don't have any say in their representation. Now, I'm taking my own photograph through a mirror. Again, Jack and Delia are being done to, I'm doing to myself. So there's some, those echoes of, 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 I guess, yeah, star similarity, but also I'm deliberately showing there's some difference in there as well, because I'm living in a very different space and time. And um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, um, which interested in what you said about haunting. Um, Dr. Joy DeGroy has a book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, where she talks about how, you know, the trauma for enslavement goes through generations in the same way of traumatic stress disorder. Um, and, you know, Holocaust, there's studies that talk about the trauma going through generations. So it's very much looking at, a, uh, you know, African enslaved experience, but there's echoes across other things. Um, so using photography in these ways to negotiate, to ask questions, to try to visualise, you know, and I could say, say all that in an essay, but pulling on the thread of my photography, but with anthropology critique in there um, as well. And very much a lot, big part of what I do is critiquing anthropology, but at the same, still, same time kind of study it and, you know, you know there's tools that are useful, but you want to kind of also um, resist against some of them as well. Um, Sarah Pink talks about how when anthropologists do not go to some distant land, collect data and then bring it home, the relationship between research and researchers' everyday life becomes all the more significant as alterity and sameness are sought in more familiar contexts. This not only brings about new ways of working, but new forms of reflexivity and consciousness of the ethnographer. Um, so this idea of working close to home and working, so even when I was studying and training as an anthropologist at SOAS, I was very much interested in the anthropology of the everyday. I wasn't interested in going to some far off land. Um, very much, and even before I studied photography, I was a documentary filmmaker, and very much interested in, yeah, what happens in your locale, local stories and these kind of things. And that comes from my, you know, even when my PhD came later, I was working in community media before that. So my, my documentary practice in television was informed by working with media and my kind of, my partner in crime, Rob Mitchell, we set up a production company together where we specialised in media education and working with groups, whether they're younger people, older people, but working, you know, I guess when I left television, we were interested in working in the kind of a, a different paradigm because we were very aware that working in television as he did as well, even though you've got your ethics and you want to work with people and celebrate the story, you are parachuting into communities doing what you do and parachuting out again, regardless of your own ethics, that's just the machine you work in. Um, so we got slightly frustrated by that. We still worked in TV, but then we were working in TV as first-born creatives, so we were able to define the terms a little bit more, and even if we are stretching the budget, at least we were doing it with the integrity we wanted. So yeah, this working close to home, but then it makes you self-reflect, and I think you've all kind of touched on that a little bit in what you were all talking about. Um, and this is one of the early, again, working close to home, working things out. This is one of the early experiments that I did. 
that just came out of the blue, just came out of nowhere. I was contacted by my friend Nadia Williams, who's also an actress. Um, in the trend, in the last series, she was one of the people showing, I think it was Princess Diana, she was in the last series, wasn't she, Princess mm -hmm. Diana? She was showing Princess Diana around the AIDS hospital when she visited America, and I was just watching it. I was going, Nadia! <laughs> and even when she was in it, she didn't tell anyone. Um, but she, her, so her mum, it was her mum's birthday, and she, Nadia wanted to recreate some photographs that have always been on the dressing table in the living room. And she thought that'd be a nice thing to give to her mum. Um, so I was like, yeah, cool, come in. You know, went to the photography studio, third floor at Bower Ashton, tried to match them up as best we could. Um, and, you know, she's happy with the prints. And then when I gave her the prints, I said, oh, why don't you interview your mum? When you showed her the pictures, why don't you interview her? about the pictures, just have a conversation. And she's like, oh yeah, you know, that sounds fine. Sounds a bit weird, but I'll do it. <laughs> um, and then she said, oh, when should we do it? I said, no, no, I don't want to be there. Do you know what I mean? This is a mother and daughter thing. I don't want to be there. Just use your phone and just record, just, just record it. So uh, she was asking for some kind of prompt questions. Because she, you know, she wasn't sure what I was going on about. And I wasn't sure what I was going on about. Um, but I just thought it would be an interesting thing to capture. So I just play you. Just three minutes long, I'll play you that conversation. I'll just edit a bit. Hello, Mark. Hello, Mark. Um, what do you remember about the day that you had the first taken? Where were you? Um, I was in the bathroom. Where were you? I was in the bathroom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was in the bathroom. And where was that? Well, I was in the street. In Bristol? Yes. Um, and what was the occasion? Why were you having these photos taken? I just fancy getting dressed up and having a nice photograph of myself. Oh. And how old were you? I think I was, ooh, 22? 22. 22. Yeah. Okay. And um, did you pay for the occasion? Yeah, I paid for the photographer. Mm -hmm. But I did the makeup myself. Right. And um, was this the first time that you had a photo session of yourself? Yeah. And you just, you just felt like it? Um, now, when you look at these pictures, what do you see? I see a very nice young lady back in the day. And um, what were you doing? I mean, were you working at the time? No, I think I stopped to have a baby. Oh, what baby did you stop to have? I think it was you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. I thought it was when you were pregnant with Alton, my older brother, but no, okay. I did before. Right, okay. So what were your dreams at that time when you were 22 and pregnant with me? What goal did you have for the future? Did you have any dreams for the future at that age? Um, no, just keep having kids and kids to grow up and be happy. And how many kids did you want to have? Six. Six? Mm -mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'll stop it there. So, you know, uh, it's just a very sweet interaction, but what I really liked about that was just Nadi had no idea that her mum was pregnant with her in, when that picture was taken. And that's a photograph that Nadi's grown up with, always known about. You know, when they always talk about photographs, that that's the thing that you would grab, you know, from burning building, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's not until you have that conversation that you actually then start to find out more things. And we take a lot of things for granted that surround us. And, um, but actually, they feel very familiar, but actually we have really no idea, really, once you scratch the surface, what's going on. And, you know, that's, for me, there's a whole range of things there. I'll touch on some of this later, but the importance of interviewing people close to you about their life and about different aspects of their life, because I think we always take those things for granted. Um, but I think it's just really... Just, even not for project, just just do it. I think we should be forced to do it when we're at school. Do you know what I mean? It should just be a, a compulsory thing we do. But you can't use it for research, though. What's that, sir? You can't use it for research if you do that. Well, it depends on how you do it and how the, the process that you go through it. Because really. you, need, you need ethical... Yeah, 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 yeah. No, exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, I think there's different ways that you can support that, really. Mm -hmm. And I'll probably go into that a bit, really. Um, so yeah, the parents taking things for granted, even objects, things that are familiar, 
Um, and just that, that, yeah, just that kind of proximity to familiarity or assumed familiarity when actually there's a lot of unknown. Um, so that was one, just a very small project, you know, it was just like a little thing that we did, but started to inform some of the thinking that kind of later developed, uh, quite unconsciously really, back then I wasn't thinking about developing methodology as such. Another project that was just a small kind of just thing I did, which was um, also 2012, the night before the Olympic relay, I remember 2012 when the Olympic torches went through cities and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I lived near a route in Bristol where it was going to go through. And I just had the idea, just randomly really, that when I started to know the route where it was going to go, and he saw the bunting go up, um, I was thinking, yeah, it'd be really cool to just capture just that route, that night before thing, with just with all the flags and stuff like that. And the very night, the, so the next day it was going through, and I thought, if I don't do it tonight, I'm just going to miss that opportunity. So I, was, I remember I was out at a restaurant for someone's birthday, and I got back home, and it was about kind of midnight by then. And I just kind of parked up about two miles away, and then just walked with my camera in the middle of the night taking photographs um, and I call it quiet preparation, quiet patriotism because it's very different to the carnival. I was there the next day as well and it's crowds everywhere, you know, um, and it's like a carnival atmosphere but I was interested in this much more quiet symbolism and these quiet celebration that obviously that you get in the middle of the night kind of thing where, you know, is, is just completely empty. So it's just a really lovely kind of walk. Um, and I know one of the people who lived in one of the houses, because when we lived somewhere else, they were living opposite, and then when we moved, you know, they weren't a million miles away kind of thing. So I contacted um, the, you know, the, the mother of the house, the lady of the house, and just said, oh yeah, I took a picture of your house in the middle of the night <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. Can I just have a conversation about that? So, and it's just done over, um, I think it's Facebook Messenger, yes, yeah, so that's 2013. And just having a conversation about what were your memories of that day with the flags and had you done it before? Um, and just, yeah, little, little prompt questions. And then, you know, what she was talking about has that they don't usually do that or don't usually go in for that kind of type of celebration that they felt as they now lived on the route it's actually really lovely and the kids really enjoyed it um so she said the first i think it's that the first and the last time they put up flags was st george's day but she said for the carnival for the for the olympic torch thing that the children got involved and they were really interested in putting up the flags it became a bit of a ritual for the day so she said that every year that they would like to keep doing that um, is a bit of a, yeah, just a little bit of a family ritual kind of thing, which I thought was kind of nice. So just a little tiny photo elicitation, you know, showing the picture and then using the picture to prompt narrative, to prompt memory, and to prompt ideas. So just a little photo elicitation exercise. And again, it's just a fragment, it's just small. And out of things like this, definitely this is where small anthropology start to emerge. So I'm just into this, just these small interactions, you know, there's no funding, it's just me, walking around Facebook Messenger. Um, and, but I just like that kind of that smallness, that humbleness of it, rather than, you know, again, I mean, when I work, worked in television, made programs for television, you know, you've got crew, you know, I'm a director, and you've got a camera person, and a sound person, and lighting, and all this kind of stuff. And the first program I made out of university for TV was a documentary on youth homelessness in Bristol. And so we'd be talking to this young girl about coming out of care, age 16, and talking about her experience, and really intimate, you know, she didn't want to be shown, she was in silhouette. So I was asking her the questions, and surrounded by this big bloody crew, whereas when I was at university, I was very keen on just shooting stuff myself, just really intimate, and that's why I like documentary as well, just that intimacy. So I had, and this was in the days of unions in t television, so I kind of had to really fight and negotiate to also be able to shoot stuff myself, 
even though I wasn't employed as a camera person, do you know what I mean? I was employed in different roles, well, unions were really strict. So some of the interviews I did for that documentary were just literally just me, and this was the early days of digital video cameras, because I just wanted that intimacy. I don't want all these people hanging around. So again, it's a bit like this, just these small fragments and these small intimate things, rather than the paraphernalia of the big projects. And I have done those big project things, and that's all well and good. But that's why I kind of want my cake and eat it. Sometimes I want to pull that thread, sometimes I want to pull that thread. Why well, shouldn't I have that cake and eat it? Do you know what I mean? We fought hard to be here. So, um, I'll, yeah. So 2016, around, um, I had a website, because my website before this was Firstborn Creatives website, and I kind of developed my own kind of identity as, a, as what I do, and I called it Small Anthropologies. I think before that I called it Visual Anthropology, and then I kind of changed it to Small Anthropology. So this is when it started to emerge. So I know we've probably taken up far too much time in the preamble. Um, so on the site, had this write, write this essay, Why Anthropology, Why Small Anthropology, the Gold, Johan Dalton quote. I kind of asked myself, am I supping with the devil? Aligning myself with anthropology. But then I was also looking at how many anthropology anthropologists today are people that were once formally studied. You know, Jemo Kenyatta, the first pri prime minister, president of Kenya, was a Anthropologist studying with Baron or Um, you know, Le Le Jake, Le Le Jacob Huey, Deborah Thomas, there's plenty of uh, anthropologists now from demographics that were formerly would have been the studied ones and now turning the tables and having their own voice and using that as an empowerment, engagement, talking about um, these things. And again, the, the leader, uh, Linda Jacobs Huey. After she says that research is a very dirty word, she then says to acquiesce is to lose ourselves entirely and implicitly agree with all that's been said about us. To resist is to retrench into the margins, retrieve what we were and remake ourselves. The past, our stories, local and global, the present, our communities, culture, languages and social practices, all may be spaces of marginalisation, but they also become spaces of resistance and hope. So you don't just give in, and say, well, I'm not going to do it because there's the systems against me, or um, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to do that discipline. I don't want to do photography because it's tainted. I don't want to do anthropology because it's tainted. Yeah, everything's tainted, and I guess I, I suppose I'm someone who's interested in getting in there and changing it. And you, you know, I'm no no rose tinted glasses. It's not possible to do that in totality, but at least you can do what you can do, I suppose. Um, and so I'm interested in that, that as a media producer, and I'm also interested in that as a researcher, academic as well. I mean, the only reason I got into art in the first place was because it's the only thing I was good at at school. And then when I started to become a bit more politicised, I started to use it to say something. So it's, it's at the core of what I do, really. So I try to bring it with me, like luggage, wherever I go. <laughs> Um, so this is not a plug, as it says there, but as Gillian says, just written this book, the Declaration of Conflict of Interest. Gillian was the editor of the book. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for all your hard work. Um, but so think this thing about working close to home, um, I kind of took that literally, I suppose, and started to become very interested in domestic space, as I said, inspired by work with Nadia, Nadia's stories in there with her mum and you know some of these other fragments that I've been talking about and I basically the book goes room to room and I kind of stop at different objects at a time and start to do a deep dive into those objects and a bit of an analysis and extract story, extract narrative, extract thinking um, and try to join dots between history and the present and you know just using these inanimate objects to do that. Um, and when I first put the proposal in, so it was a Rightledge book, and when I first put the first proposal in, which was 2017, 2018, something like that, it was vaguely that, you know, as you know with your PhD, things change, but it was roughly this. Um, yeah, it definitely did evolve, but 
I don't think at that time I kind of mentioned small anthropology as the methodology because I was still very tentative with it as well. As time went on, writing it, reframing it, I, you know, asking for extensions, and I asked for quite a few extensions to write the thing, I started to get more confident, actually, you know what, I should be using this opportunity to develop the small anthropology thinking. So in the introduction, it talks about small anthropology and it says, this is what it's trying to do. But it's still very tentative. The book isn't a book of theory of small anthropology. I kind of mention it in some of the chapters going through it. But even after writing this book, it's still to be developed. So what I want to do now for the rest of the lecture is talk about what I think small anthropology is. And I kind of talk about it in these three sections. Um, and the first section is knowledge hierarchies then knowledge values, creative inquiry, showing behind the scenes and output values. And these are the things, you know, re retrospectively, as you, as you say, kind of thinking, okay, yeah, this is what I've been doing. And try and put a framework around it. Um, so hopefully this worked. As I said, it's the first time I'm doing this, so thank you. It's actually been really useful writing this lecture <laughs> just for myself. Um, so, challenging knowledge hierarchy. So the first one, there's no inherent hierarchy between academic and community sources of knowledge. I'll just play this, just a little bit. Vibration. And that's the message of Rastafari to the earth. That even though we are from different places, even though we are from different backgrounds, different color eyes, different skin tone, Instead of allowing these differences to separate us, we can actually celebrate them, yes? And build an orchestra for life, yes? So the essence of the Rastafari music is built on the foundation of the base, the mother energy, the energy of the heart. That's the essence of Rastafari. It's a heart movement, yes? We have been ruled a lot by the heads, both heads, and we have destroyed the planet in a very terrible way. So we want to now connect to the female energy, the mother energy, the heart, yes? And that's very, very important to us. So the face is played from a timing of the heartbeat. So you listen to yourself and to your heart when you are listening to the Rastafari music, yeah? We also have what is called the Punde, Also, follows the timing of the heart. We also have the shaker. It's not piercing over there. <laughs> and it also follows the timing of the heart. Yeah? And then you have the activity that carries the message of the heart. So I did film that. That's the main speaker. Was first man. He's um, from Jamaica. That was filmed at uh, the. It was a reggae festival in Newport uh, a few months ago, and I kind of I, I just sort of show it as an example of. Um, so I just I love the way how he describes it. Loves the way he talks. Goes straight to the demonstration, seamlessly into the music and the singing. You know that could be written up as an academic paper. You know this, that, and the other, Rastafari, I believe, this, that, and the other, whatever. But, you know, first man may have PhDs coming out of his ears, I, I don't know. But what I kind of like about it is just, I guess, is that collapse, which goes into the next one, of visual, audio, you know, coming from a place which isn't rooted in what you would call academic, but it's still no less knowledgeable, still no less informed 
whether you agree with it or not agree with it isn't really the point. We don't agree with a lot, lot of things. Um, but I just, you know, it's just that authority of how he was speaking and presenting. And I think even there was someone who knows that culture quite well, rather than me dis distilling that into an academic paper, just let him speak for himself because he's very, you know what I mean? It's like, I, it doesn't need me to mediate to say what he said. <laughs> I can't play the drums that well, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I think we get into this, well, I'm going to talk about it a little in a bit, but it's not a false binary, it's not a false dichotomy um, because we should think, yeah, obviously, knowledge resides in communities and knowledge resides in academic spaces, and we shouldn't think their intention. But they do come into tension. I'll explore that in, in a moment. Um, how do I kind of explore this in my in the book? And I don't I don't want this to feel crass. I'm not I'm not pitching this book, but I just want to show you how to put how I put some of these things into practice. Um, so in chapter 15 is the chapter about the sent for child's bedroom. So the sent for child was a child that was left in the West Indies after their parents came over, um, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, etc. And then when they had enough money, they then brought that child over. So sometimes by the time the child was brought over, the parents had already then had more children and established they came into a situation as the eldest child, which they often felt slightly alienated from. And I kind of see it in lots of different situations. Um, so I interviewed this person about their story. Before I interviewed them, I didn't actually know fully what their story was. I just knew they had a story to tell, and I knew it was something that they wanted to... And listening to their story, I was like, wow, you know, this is kind of really powerful. And, um, and it kind of evolved into this chapter, which is basically her telling her story. And I, I, in, in, I introduce it in the chapter by saying, as academics, we interrupt a lot. We put in our interpretations, our quotes, our references, do you know what I mean? We're always, inter we're always interrupting. <laughs> Even when we say we're doing things in a participatory way, you know, we're bringing in our analysis, we're bringing in Freud or whoever it is. And actually, you know, I, I just wanted her to speak for herself. So that's what the rest of the chapter does. Do you know what I mean? It's literally, I just introduce it, and then the next five, six pages are just her. And I don't even end it with me. It's just her. And I... I, I guess I like doing things slightly disruptive. I, I'm like, you know, and I have to say, sending it to Gillian and Ben, I just thought, oh, they're just going, this is an academic book. So I, just, <laughs> I was really nervous. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But I guess I wanted to do something that was slightly different. Um, and, you know, so I was in, and it, again, doing that chapter was tapping into my community practice, community media giving people the camera so they tell their own story is tapping into that really um, but you know going back to this relationship between academia and community media uh, uh, sorry communities um, you know there has to be there's some very real power tensions or, or imbalances power imbalances you know so you think we all come from communities each one of us comes from somewhere go to university, we don't always go back to the communities that we're born in from. So there's, there's a bit of an extraction going on when it comes to communities. Um, and then we do what we do, myself included, and then we're writing these papers, etc., etc. Um, and then also mindful that when we go back and work with, whether it's our own community or other communities, neighbourhoods, there can be an extraction of knowledge. You know, we want to interview people, taking their knowledge, taking their information, and bringing it into our space. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying don't do it. You know, that is part of what we do. We have to kind of accept it. Do you know what I mean? There is a bit of taking things on the chin. But as I said at the very beginning, we have to be aware of it. So when we're doing it, we're trying to do it in as ethically a way as possible. But it is part of what we do. But how do we do? knowledge exchange, knowledge transfer, which is in a, you know, and I'm, again, I'm not going to say, yet yeah, do this, do that, the other, but it's about being the mindful, but there's an extraction of knowledge that often happens. Even entering in funded projects with communities, it's the universities that hold funding, 
you have to find ways and loopholes how to pay your community partner, say you're renting rooms and all this kind of stuff just to pay them, do you know what I mean? And you're just trying to, they're trying to, often the community projects, organisations are volunteer led or they're precarious funding situations. So there is an imbalance and then they're working on these university projects. Um, but the, you know, there's, there is a, there is a financial and a kind of a, a, a labour economy difference. Um, communities can be ignored, co-opted, um, and I think we often forget the machine that we're in as universities and the power that has. We sit in neighbourhoods, we sit geographically in spaces with houses around, students living in spaces. We're interested in what's happening in the community as academics. But then how do we then sustain that relationship? How do we sustain that um, conversation? Our funding happens, what happens then? Is it just because we're working on these things because we've got funding and deadline? Or why are we actually interested in forming that relationship and that ongoing conversation? So being mindful of that. And we can also go in with our own agendas and not often be receptive to the agendas that are coming in the other way. So many academics do try and combat these imbalances, even from what I've heard of yours. These are things that you're mindful of. Um, so yeah, we just have to do what each of us can do to try to lessen them. And there are different frameworks. I'm not gonna get into a solutions base, but it's just, and again, that's why this fragment, this small anthropology is doing things in these small ways where these things can be managed. No inherent hierarchy between text, visual, and audio material. Um, so I kind of just using this as an example, Sun and Pan Peep, René Magritte, you know, sure you all know this, the conversation about, you know, this is not pipe, well it is a pipe, or no it's not as a representation of the pipe, or what does representation of a pipe mean? The image is pointing towards an idea of a pipe. So the image becomes, and use a word, indexical, that that is pointing to an idea of this physical object we call a pipe. And all these conversations, like right, this image, are actually semiotics, you know, and it's getting into that representation conversation and semiotics, which has got a whole academic background, Charles Sanders Pierce, Frederick de Saussure, linguistics. But actually, the image itself, just plays with you, you have a conversation, and it's doing some jobs of triggering conversations and ideas. Um, that's why I said also like total recall, do you know what I mean? There's lots of things that we're inspired by that, that actually have no lesser place in the conversation as something else. Um, this image, when we see this image, I mean, what's the word that comes to mind if you see this image? What would be the unit? What would be the family? Thank you. So, same way as this, if that wasn't there, you think pipe. When we see this image, we think family, especially when we see these names and this level of intimacy. And then when you show the name of the photographer and the clue, this is, the, this is not a pipe. These people do not know each other at all. Then they're just, it's just a fabrication of a family. Um, so it plays that same game that Magritte's doing. Um, but it's all semiotics. This is all wrapped up in here, even if we're not calling it by these names. But there's academic thinking going on, and it's triggering our synapses in the same way. Mark Rothko, when I see this picture, I think, oh, you know, couldn't care less. <laughs> when I'm in the tent, seeing it in real life, I've sat there for an hour, and I've got no idea why. Do you know what I mean? Um, I don't know anything about Rothko, I haven't been that interested to read up about it, but I definitely know that his work has a visceral effect on me when I'm in front of it in person, but I can't articulate it. Do you know what I mean? It might be just the mood I was in that day. It has happened a couple of times. But when I see images of like this, that doesn't inspire me. Does, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not interested in reproduction. But there is something like being there that has that effect. So that means something. That there's something going on there. There's some knowledge 
transferring from Rothko to me or whatever is triggering something in me. I haven't looked into it yet, but there's something about that visual that's doing something that an essay couldn't do, that, you know, etc. And again, going back to the total recall, so I stopped myself because I knew I was going to get onto that, but there's, there are music, for example, and films and poems that we're inspired by. You know, why are we leaving them out of our research artificially when we actually know they do play a significant part, even if it's just a paragraph or two? Do you know what I mean? And, um, and again, this isn't me telling. I've tried to resist, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just saying what I do. So, you know, again, even in my, um, even in my dissertation at, on my BA, so that would have been in 1995, 96, I was using some lyrics in that. The whole essay was about black art, but I definitely had some lyrics in there that I was interested in deciphering. And I guess I've always been around music and popular culture, and I'm the first one in my family to go to university and all these kind of things. So I didn't really think about these barriers, what's academic, what's not. I've been working there for 20 years. I'm still not quite sure what academia is. And I think that's why I just try and make things up as I go along, so I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, and again, so this thing about interviewing friends and family. Um, this is the first bit of work I had published. This is 1996. And this book is now out of print. And I bring it, I brought it, sorry, bring it, brought it into the thing that I've just written, but there was a book in Bristol, it's organised by Geraldine Edwards, God rest her soul, and it was all about migration stories to Bristol, and um, so she was interested in, you know, local writers, um, so I said, for mine, I would do a short story, and I'll do an interview and I interviewed my parents. It was literally on the way from London to Bath, where I grew up. I was in the back seat, my sister was in the back seat, my mum and dad, dad driving, and I had a really old dictaphone that I, that I must have bought it. And, um, and I just interviewed them while we were driving. So from the time it took to London to Bath, you know, hour and a half. My dad was actually quite a slow driver, so it's a bit longer than that. Um, but I learned more in that conversation than I ever knew about them, do you know what I mean? Um, and actually, this bit of writing has been used quite a lot in different iterations. And, you know, there's someone interested in, you know, post-colonialism and cultural identity, black British identity, and all these kind of things. I can can and have researched it all out there and read Stuart Hall and Paul Gilroy and all that, but then why would I be ignoring my mum and dad who actually lived through that? And this is the point really, do you know what I mean? And often we are interested in things that we know are around us, but we actually ignore the things around us to go and interview the experts or the academics or the rooms we still, I'm not saying don't do that, but why are we ignoring also what's in front of us and taking them for granted? Do you know what I mean? Because their knowledge we could actually relate to, we could ask them all questions, whatever. Take your point about ethics and how do you use that, you know, in, in thing. Um, and, that, you know, you, you, there are ways of dealing with that in an ethical situation. And, and you know, it depends on the context of how you're using that work. Um, but ethics applications, if it's the, there's a convincing narrative that that's how you work, and then you've got the checks and balances that the agreements are there, you can use it in research. But you have to, yeah, just have to be thorough about it. But it's about telling that story, and that's the way you work, and that's the way you do. Um, not making <coughs> grand narratives or universal claims. So actually, again, my quarrel with anthropology, that I'm trying not to, one of Gillian's brilliant advice was, with small anthropology, say what it is rather than say what it isn't. Don't argue against something, just say what it is. And it's brilliant advice that I've really tried to do in my edits. Uh, but underlying it definitely is this kind of thing. So I guess thinking about, just as this is an example, and I'll try to be brief. Remember this project that I did with flags and the conversation I had with the woman who lived in the house? I could extrapolate this if I was trying to be pretentious and say, yeah, every 23rd of um, of April, when, when it's St. George's Day, um, or whenever there's some kind of festival that involves flags, then, 
you know, imagine me coming in from outside. You know, I've, I'm a, I'm a, 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 a Belgian anthropologist coming into Britain, looking at you all and your spectacle. And when I go back to Barbados, I say, yeah, you know, St. George's Day, when they do this, all the family get together and they do it every year. You can imagine that being talked up as a narrative, quite a convincing narrative. Those things have been said about different people in Africa and India and South America for, for centuries. And they're believed because they're in books and they've been written by eminent academics and blah, blah, blah. But it's obviously, we know it's a fallacy. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You know, one family might do it, two families might do it, but that doesn't mean them all do it. That, that is kind of a lazy extrapolation. But when you say it, you can understand how that would be believed. Yeah, they all do it, and this, that, and the other. And it's, it's, so for me, I try not to make universal claims. You know, and again, it goes back to that bite size and that individual, this is what they do, this is that story. But I'm not talking for everybody. And I don't, you know, and I think the pressure of academia, particularly PhDs, you know, what's the grand, you know, you've got new knowledge to, contribution to new knowledge. And there can be that temptation to come up with some grand unifying theory. You know, Einstein was trying to look for this grand unifying theory. So it was Levi Strauss. And all these people tried to come up with this, the theory of everything. <laughs> it's like, hang on a minute, no one's asking us to do that. Not every academic has to try to come up with these grand theories. So why do we try and do that? Do you know what I mean? So I try to deliberately scale it back. Say, I'm not doing that. I'm not interested in that. Because actually, I don't believe it anyway. <laughs> um, also, so where am I? Grand narrative. So ethics of knowledge. I don't really talk about ethics enough, probably, when I talk about small anthropology. But it is underlining most of the things. Um, but knowledge, ethics of knowledge acquisition and dissemination. So I did some writing where I'm looking at the, the Last Supper portrait or picture in my mum's and dad's house and the one I had in my own bedroom. And I talk about the codes and the symbols and the symbolism, if you know them and if you don't, and try to extrapolate it. This one was my dad's and he always told my sister and me that there's, a, that there's a that there's a clue there's um there's yeah there's a clue in the picture that if someone from outside come and saw that they would know something about him they would know his theological kind of position and um, but he never told us what it was so we would and it's the shimmering you know you get that 3d effect where you look that way and that way so it's one of these kind of shimmering sort of pictures and we can never find it Independently, I then found out what it was, but my dad's no longer with us, so I don't say that in the book because he doesn't give me permission to tell that story. Do you know what I mean? So, is that line and knowing what's appropriate or what's not to tell? And actually, there's no one placing my shoulder. I could have told that, got away with it. Do you know what I mean? But it's actually knowing yourself what feels right and what doesn't feel right. So, the ethics application or not, we've all got an in internal ethics meter and we often have to pay more attention to that um, so going down one learning from the everyday and the mundane I won't dwell on this I think that's probably you understand that's what I'm interested in <coughs> oh god sorry I went the wrong way I literally stopped on my mum and dad's hallway and the <coughs> sign, as soon as you come through the front door, and, and it says, when you come here, what you see here, what we, no, sorry, when you come here, what you see here, what you hear here, what we do here, what we say here, when you leave here, let it stay here. And it says, welcome at the top. And it says, Barbados at the bottom. So I was interested in this very clash, welcome, but, <laughs> And then it's got this Barbados. Semiotically, we know that this isn't talking about Barbados. We understand this is a souvenir that was bought in Barbados. We just know that instantly without having to decipher it. But how do we know that? Do you know what I mean? It's not that obvious. But we just understand that means souvenir. I won't get into tacit knowledge, but that's what that is. But I was interested in this welcome but. 
Um, and when we go to people's houses, usually we don't, we're not doing this. We're not sitting down and analysing stuff. As an academic, we can do that. Uh, I'm not going to read this out, but I talk about that souvenir thing. I talk about the hair. The hair doesn't mean Barbados. The hair means where your feet are when you're reading it. But in that chapter, which essentially is about the house and getting in a house with keys, I talk about the hardship that, you know, we talk about the really much generation had when they came over, hostile environment, you know, you know that narrative. My mum said to me, don't bring the police to my front door when I was a kid. You know, they worked so damn hard to get the house and to get the keys, then they don't want some kid, <laughs> even though it's the kid that they belongs to them, ruining the name, you know, their reputation, etc. So it's that, you know, it's that tough love of a teenager kind of thing. Um, song lyrics I included, Maccabee's got this song called Invasion, he uses the house as a metaphor for colonialism. So he says, if a man in your house told you to come out and told you to live in the garden, if it happened to you, what, tell me what would you do, would you fight and fight and fight them? So basically, imagine your house, someone comes through the front door, tells you to live in the garden, they live in your house. So an analogy for colonialism. I talk about Chine, um, Chinua Abchebe, things fall apart, African village, they invite the missionaries in, and the missionaries end up slowly taking over. So that inviting into your house, into your space, and I kind of talk about, so using the house as a metaphor, and the inviting in as a metaphor, and then going back to this welcome but, through COVID, my mum, and then I talk about how, bring it back, you know, thinking about the warning and don't bring police to the front door. Oh, then I talk about, you know, I wonder if the mothers talked about that in West Africa when the colonialists were coming in. Um, bearing gifts. Talk about scammers trying to get through your front door. You know, there's some of your bank account details, social media passwords. And in COVID, the protection of the house is even more apparent. We're, you know, we're literally scared of our neighbours kind of thing let alone scammers trying to make the best of an opportunic situation. So then I say maybe more than should be added to the poem in the front hallway. So it's trying to, you know, so just out of that one mundane thing, when you focus on stuff, stuff starts to happen and you can start to tell a story. And that's why, yeah, I'm interested in narrative and how things can tell a narrative. Um, if you aren't judged by now, reflexivity of the researcher and the inclusion of auto-ethnographic positionality and vulnerability. I'm interested in that. Even while I showed you the picture of me as a kid at the beginning, you know, using that quote from Karis One, if you don't know the history of the author, you don't know what you're reading, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I haven't got time to go into this, but yeah, interested in the family, the, 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 the wall, the family wall that we talk about, you know, talk about Nadia's picture earlier. We don't know half the things that we think we know. Um, so in terms of my own narrative, I talk about this and some stories attached to the wall, how is my mum's preserve, even though she'd never call herself a curator or a photographer in the house, that's what she was. That was her preserve, it wasn't my dad. Um, but the one picture you won't see on the wall was this one, um, which I always hated, which I took away. I was five years old, Silver Jubilee, wearing really horrible clothes. <laughs> um, you know, I retraced them. This is actually during my PhD, and I did this as part of my PhD, but I didn't do it consciously. It's a project that kind of happened while I was doing my PhD, and then I wrote it into my PhD. Um, sometimes I feel a bit of a fraud now when I talk about this because I've actually talked about this in quite a few lectures now. So I'm not as. But the interesting thing is, is that. So I had this since 1977, and I literally, this is no lie, when I went to university in 1991, I literally took it off the wall and took it with me as my mum would show it to people. Do you know what I mean? That's how much I hated it. But I never destroyed it. And it only dawned on me when I was doing the writing that actually I should maybe, why didn't I repair that? You know, somehow this, this respect of 
the photograph was instilled on me. So I'm actually quite disappointed I didn't rip it up. Yeah, am I, am I that square? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I used to be a rebel. Um, but it wasn't until 31 years later when I thought, so it's 20, yeah, 2008, and I had the idea to reclaim it. I showed it to Bertel Martin, I showed it to Rob Mitchell, and they're the first people that I've ever showed the photograph to. Just when I had the idea of reclaiming it, gave me the confidence to talk about it and show it. And then I've kind of shown it ever since. Um, sorry, bear with me. Hope you're still with me, yeah? <laughs> Creative inquiry, getting there. Um, so again, I don't need to talk about that, but intergenerational dialogues and learnings. Just when we put different people of different age groups together, something happens. I'm always interested in that, and in increasingly interested in intergenerational dialogue, even in writing. And I guess the idea of this happened back then, and this is happening now, collapsing the past and the present. But not just having the past and the present collapsed, actually including the voices of those different generations in that. I'm interest increasingly interested in that. Um, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary theoretical positioning. Um, so multidisciplinary being you've got multiple disciplines and subject areas and theories, but they all exist in their own silos, you know, attacking the subject. Interdisciplinary is when it kind of cuts across and creative practice is learning from psychology and etc. etc. So there's a network across where multidisciplinary is more channels. So I'm interested in both. I don't really make the distinction between one or the other. Sometimes it becomes slightly interchangeable, but that's what the terms mean. So how many different ways, this is for you to talk now, I just, I don't want a number, what different ways can we start to think about a water bottle for different disciplines? Just throw some ideas out there. Chemical structure. It's chemical structure. Chemical structure. So the materiality. Thank you. Great. The, the manufacturing process it went through and all the human stuff. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Thank design you. Design aesthetics. Design aesthetics. Thank you. So that's all great. There's more. There's going to be more. Yeah. Loads. Um, I've put some down, as you probably guessed. Design health, water consumption. Design ergonomics, you know, some examples, sociology, changing habits called social knowledge, free water fountains and educational workspaces. You know, growing up, we didn't have water everywhere, we didn't have these things, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but now it's a thing. But that thing has happened because society has got us to this place. Anthropology and psychology, I couldn't really distinguish between the two, but ritual, they're now a habit. We pick them up on the first thing in the morning. Um, our relationship to the objects, I call it business studies, but essentially manufacturing, consumer market production, I mean, there's loads of stuff there. Um, you know, when we buy these things, is it the only one we own, or do we have multiple of them? What's the, what's the, what's the motivation to buy another one? Um, so people who make these things are going to be thinking, well, yeah, obviously I want to do good and help, but I actually also want to make a shitload of money. So how can we do something different to make them buy more of them? Environmentalism, so we use plastic, it's made out of plastic, but it's reusable. Again, the water fighting thing. And also history, different water carriers. If you talk to a theologian, a Christian theologian, they would probably talk about Rebecca, who's got a story about water carrier, and it's a big thing. If you go to Bath Abbey in Bath, there's a statue of Rebecca with water carrier. So there's lots of different ways of talking about stuff. And I guess in my, I probably get bored easily, which is why in all of my, even in my BA essay, I'm always attacking things from different directions and I don't really understand. <laughs> so I'm as interested in psychology and psychoanalysis as I am in something else. I'm not an expert in any of them, but I will try to draw on things that make the thing yeah, just feel interesting. And you definitely do get academics that, and I respect them, that, yeah, I do this. I attack things from a Lacanian point of view. I attack things from a visual media point of view. Do you know what I mean, I'm just not that person. I sometimes envy people that are. But, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm too fidgety. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
think that's called curiosity. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And I think it is, I think it is that writing I see also as a bit of a trait of practice, do you know what I mean? And, yeah. And so, mixed methods, going down one, so mixed methods in approaches and outputs. So this is about theoretical positioning, how these things have been analysed, but then this is about how it's actually entering the world. And I guess I do have a bit of a polemic to think that, again, you know, in our, especially coming out of a arts faculty, we're very used to mixed methods, you know, practice-based PhDs and all these kind of things. But then often how academic texts are written up, they're not that creative, they're just, they are the standard, you know, essays, references, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think practice-based PhDs are challenging that, and you are seeing these different outputs. But there's still a format which is kind of accepted and trusted. So again, as I talked about earlier with the transcripts, you know, I've got fiction, I've got a whole chapter which is fiction. This is a bit of a polemic, but I think it ended up as a bit more of an essay. Um, the teenage bedroom is a photo story of a montage of different stuff with, you know, only about 50 words in it or something. So I try to put my money where my mouth is and actually have a creative academic output and not squash everything back into the essay with the references and all that kind of stuff. Shown behind the scenes. Um, so very quickly, you know, literally cutting a long story short. So shown behind the scenes, what I'm interested in with that is how in the writing you're showing your workings out. Often when we read something or hear presentations, maybe, but may, more in writing than maybe in presentations, it can read as if, you know, Foucault had those ideas since he was born. Do you know what I mean? And it's Marx had those ideas since he was born. It's all worked out. What we don't really read in those things is how they're working it out. They tripped up, and then they suddenly realised that being on the ground, they were the oppressed or whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? We don't hear that stuff, but that's the stuff I'm interested in. Um, so it connects the person with their theory, I suppose. Um, so the yes, yeah, so the point is about celebrating and accepting nuance, serendipity, and embracing the unplanned. So this is a much bigger story that I'm going to cut down. I was in a place called Fairfield House, which is where Emperor Selassie lived in the city of Bath when Mussolini invaded Ethiopia. I made a film about it in 1999, and in about a 30 seconds, maybe a little bit longer section of the film, it's an hour-long film. It included. A little fragment. This was the this was Harry Selassie's foreign advisor, also his close friend, and he died at Fairfield House, and he's buried in Locksbrook Cemetery, just down from Fairfield House. So this is 1999. I filmed. I went to the gravestone. I found the gravestone and filmed it. The speech that Harry Selassie read at the graveside. Benjamin Zephaniah, who was presenting the TV documentary, recited the quote. But after that, I don't think anything more of it, because it wasn't the main story. It's just a little incidental bit in a much bigger story, which actually was about Holly Selassie, not him. Um, many years later, I was at Fairfield House, and it was an Ethiopian cultural day, and I got talking to this older lady. I'm, quite, I'm sometimes quite socially awkward. I just sit in the corner and talk to anyone. So actually, the fact that I talked to her itself was serendipity, because I was just making small talk. And she said, yeah, her grandfather used to live here and died here. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. What's his name? She said, Blattinger Hairway. I said, oh, I know about Blattinger Hairway because I included him in a film that I made, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, yeah, his grave is down the road in Locksburg Cemetery. And she said, no, he's buried in Ethiopia. And I said, yeah, I know. His grave was exhumed in 1955, but his grave stone is still there. She didn't believe me. She had no idea that grave stone and it's got Amharic writing, if you see that, that's Ethiopian script. So it's a very noticeable grave. So she didn't believe me, very politely, but she just didn't believe me. So I said, oh, we go there, let's have a look. So, um, and you see, it's just down the road. And about five or six cars were following my cars. I took her and her grandchildren to the cemetery. And I suddenly thought, shit. Is it the same guy? It's not painting this. I may have got this horribly wrong. Sort of thing. Um, so went to the grave, 
by luck I knew where it was because a few years before someone else was doing research and I showed them the grave and at that point I knew that it was broken up so this is the you know over those I haven't been back there pretty much only once in that time so as graves happen that's what we found if at the same point I just had some funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council to do research around Fairfield House and history, which I obviously had plans for. Um, but at, around the grave, we started having these conversations. This is Pauline, who manages Fairfield House. And we started to talk about, actually, this is a significant site, and we should do something to restore it. So I used some of the, you know, I, I, I rewrote the, some parts of the proposal to incorporate this, because again, this was an agenda coming from the community, yeah? And that point I made earlier, we often go in with our own ideas without actually listening. So I reframed it so it's about what was the community wanting rather than me going in and write, you know, what was written on the script. So we did some fundraising activities, I used to run, run some of the money directly, but two years later we got the whole grave restored. Um, five generations of a family were there for the unveiling. People, you know, Ethiopian community came from all over the country to be there, including Haile Selassie's grandson, who did the unveiling. Um, and we did it as a public thing. There was no press release. It's literally that family and who they wanted to be there. And it, for me, it's one of the highlights of my career doing something like that. Do you know what I mean? Because it just, it just meant a lot to, to them. Um, making the method transparent and conflating process and output. I don't know if there should be an image there. Okay. So, again, when I said earlier, it wasn't until doing this presentation that I realised that, or remembered, that this is the roots of small anthropology, so conflating and process and output. So, as I'm, you know, going back to the tripping up Karl Marx analogy, which obviously is fabrication, I don't know if you did try, <laughs> but that thing of on the page showing where I've changed idea or those in the writing, I do say, I, well, I started writing this chapter thinking one thing, but now reflecting on it, and I think something else, and actually saying that in the writing itself. Um, and then finally, the final channel, storytelling. Um, oh, sorry, output values. So it's about how the things enter the world and style. So the first one being storytelling. Um, there's a theorist was a theorist, um, I guess he's a f f science philosopher, you could call Paul Freyabend, Against Method is his most famous book, The Anarchist Approach to Science or something like that, you know it, yeah. Um, and he talks about deconstruction, I'm not going to read this whole quote, but he talks about deconstruction, which is this theory from Jack Der Derrida, and he says, well I will read it actually, it is one of the merits of deconstruction to have undermined philosophical commonplaces and thus to have made some, oh sorry, I'm reading this really badly. It is one of the merits of deconstruction to have undermined philosophical commonplaces and thus to have made some people think. Unfortunately, it affected only a small circle of insiders and it affected them in ways that are not always clear, not even to them. That's why I prefer Destroy, who was a great, popular, and funny deconstructor, while Der Derrida, for all his good intentions, can't even tell a story. <laughs> and I love that quote. So he's basically said, deconstruction's a good idea. It's so bloody hard to read that only a few people got it, and they're still not quite sure what it is. And Destroy, I had to look up who he was. I'd never heard of him before. But he was an entertainer, a singer, musician. But also he was a revolutionary and he joined the revolution and all his work is also very political. So he's not doing something that different to Derrida, but also because he was a raconteur and a performer, he entertained as well. Um, and so even though he knows Derrida's doing something interesting, can, and I agree with that, I've really tried with Derrida and deconstruction, even for the book, I was thinking, yeah, this would be useful, I'm probably doing some deconstruction. But it's just impenetrable. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't mind admitting that. You know, Foucault, I love his ideas. But I usually like Foucault when I'm reading someone else about Foucault rather than his own work. 
archaeology of knowledge I've definitely got into, but I don't always find that stuff easy, do you know what I mean? So I have to kind of read around things, so okay, that's what they're kind of going on about. I'm definitely not a natural theorist, um, so I completely get it, I completely get it, and a lot of, you know, Bart, I, I, out of those, the French critical theorists from that era, Roland Bart's probably the one I engage with, I won't say easier, but yeah, more comfortable, you know, especially as work around photography, I find them a bit more accessible. But a lot of them, it's like, what? what? I want to get it. I want to understand it. Someone tell me what they're talking about. So telling stories to extrapolate and get around theories, I think, is a good way. And I like it when people do that. So I think it makes things more accessible. Narrative fragments, I've talked about that already. Um, so I won't go into this too much. But maybe these are some of the touch points where I like these narrative fragments is readable, digestible, maybe it's for people with short attention spans, but also the style of writing. I was listening to Reddit four ages ago and it's interviewing a, a writer and she was saying how it's her second novel and the interviewer said, oh, it's written in these small paragraphs and clip sentences. Is that style that you've been developing for a long time? And she said, well, no, I had a baby. And literally, when the baby was asleep, half an hour, I was on the kitchen table writing. And so that was the style that developed, do you know what I mean? And I really love that. And that, that's, I guess that's a bit of behind the scenes. You know, she's saying, oh, yeah, you know, this was a style that was developed by Mikael Batsin, Polyphonic, what, you know, she said, no, I was writing when I had a chance to. Do you know what I mean? I just love that honesty, I suppose. And I think that's a bit of me as well, really. Um, and plain language, which, um, again, I think I've covered that. And again, ending with Keras one as I started, in 1992, he had this song called Question and Answers, and he says, everything you learn in law school can be taught when you're six years old, but they make you wait and wait and wait and wait, and then the information is then sold. But what if you can't afford to pay? You walk around ignorant all day. Um, and again, it's just that, you know, I guess there's another quote that I could have put in, is each one teach one. You know, if we're interested in education, we're interested in our work, doing something, I'm always interested in how can research be useful, be, yeah, just doing something in the world. Then, why are we doing so? And again, I'm not critiquing Derrida, I'm not, I'm not saying that's one thing to do, but I guess I want to try to or I'm interested in different ways that work can reach people and have an effect on people. So if a six-year-old can read something, a children's book, or learn a nursery rhyme that's going to teach them something about law, and then that stays with them for the rest of their life, then do it. We learn nursery rhymes to learn the tables, to learn the alphabet. You know, we, we have these modes of trying to take in knowledge, which is often rhyme-based or music-based, etc., or art-based, the alphabet, and apple, blah, blah, blah. What's the bee? Banana? A <laughs> ball? Whatever it is. I've forgotten. But you get my point. The cat, the sea. So we use these interdisciplinary practices from child. But then when we get an adult, we do away with them because it feels childish. And maybe I'm saying keep hold of them. Um, so that's the scope of small anthropology. Still developing. So Pink talks about sensory knowledge. Um, this is literally the penultimate slide. Um, to access embodied sens sensory knowledge and anthropological field work. The anthropologist has no choice but to use body and soul in addition to intellect as a means of approaching others' experience. Linguistic utterances might provide a clue, but they can not be depended on. There is also the full range of bodily senses. So, plan towards our strengths. And and when I say that, I guess that's as human beings, we've grown up with listening, touching, smelling. So, but then when we come into our research, we often put a lot of that to the side and just focus on one part of our brain, but we can still bring all of that with us. And that's the end. Um, so hopefully... <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it recording actually for 